It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Courage involves facing our fears, but it's also about resilience, grit, and having a built-in BS detector and knowing when and how to use it. Joining us today to talk about how we can heighten our natural instincts to move from fear to fearlessness is Evie Pamporis, author of the book, Becoming Bulletproof, Protect Yourself, Read People, Influence Situations, and Live Fearlessly. Evie is a former Secret Service Special Agent who is the recipient of the United States Secret Service Medal of Valor Award for her heroism on 9-11. She has been part of the protective details for former Presidents Obama, both Bushes, Clinton, and Ford. She co-stars on Bravo Spy Games. Welcome, Evie. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So, Evie, let's begin by talking about your amazing career. What was your path to joining the Secret Service? You know what? I didn't have a traditional path. I know there's many people when they're growing up, this is kind of their dream. They know exactly what they want. And I, I, I didn't have that. I didn't have anybody in a, who had been in law enforcement or, or worked even in, in, in the Secret Service or in the federal government. But I always had this, I had two things. I had a drive to help people. And I had a drive to not be full of fear. I grew up in a very low-income na- neighborhood, government-subsidized hi- housing. My parents were, were immigrants from another country, and we dealt with a lot of struggles and a lot of crime. And I think, you know, traditionally when you grow up, one or two things will happen to you in life. You either become more afraid or you, be, you, you rebel against fear. And you say, you know what, I'm done with it. And I'm done with seeing people around me being hurt and being vulnerable. And I think that that is really, in the core, what led me to go into this career, to protect other people, to serve other people, and and by proxy, to become a stronger, more resilient human being. Do you think your upbringing helped you be more intuitive or have a little bit more street smarts so you could get the job done? Mm, That's a really great, great question. You know, there's been some research where they looked at kids who grew up in inner cities. I grew up in New York City and uh, in a, a rougher area. And they found that kids that grew up in inner cities and in rougher environments tend to be more resilient later on in life than those kids who grow up in more protective environments. And I think that the, 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 the crux of it is when you grow up in a difficult environment, you're you're used to dealing with problems and adversities. And so from a young age, you begin to problem solve. You begin to start figuring out how to solve an issue or problem. But when you're too cocooned, when you're not dealing with a lot of obstacles when you're growing up and you're, you're, you're extremely shielded, it, it, it does you a disservice because now, later on in life, when things do happen, you don't get that job, you get fired, you break up in a relationship, you're not getting the things you thought you should get, you struggle. And then you get into the, this depression place and you think I'm not, you know, it, 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 it attacks you internally. So I, I do think that struggle, even at a young age, is an important thing because it helps us. And that's been a debate that's been going on. I mean, I'm middle age. And so when I grew up, we weren't mollycoddled at all. I mean, we learned how to take our lumps in life. And I think sometimes we're not doing our children a service when everyone gets a trophy for playing Little League or something. We're not teaching them to be resilient. No, you're not. I mean, I, and this is the thing, like when I went, went through training, it was very clear. You, you pass training, you don't pass, you go home. They, they don't want you. It's the U.S. Secret Service, like we have no time. And they even had, a, you know, um, competition within us, like who gets number one. And there was only one number one. There is no number. It's whoever gets number one gets number one. You have to perform. So I think when we take that element out, then if everybody gets a trophy, why should I perform? Why should I work so hard? We're all equal. You want Fairness and equality on a fundamental level is extremely important. But you, you want to allow that person to feel that they are working hard to accomplish something, to achieve something. And when we, we hand everything to another person, especially at a young age, again, it's like how are you helping them in the long term? Because when you're not around and they have a struggle, they're not going to know what to do. 
They're going to, they're, they're, it's going to be completely new to them. So as a kid, especially at a young age, when you're dealing with obstacles, you're dealing with them in an environment where there's not that much to lose to some extent. Whereas later on in life, when you're going to get a job or you get fired, where there's a, a bit more at stake, that's going to be more soul crushing, so to speak, because you've not, you've not dealt with this. You've not dealt with rejection. People fear doing things out of fear of failure, out of rejection. That is the best thing you can do. You want to be more resilient? Get out there and fail. Get out there and get rejected because then you're going to be that person who keeps going. The other person is going to say, you know what? Don't like how this feels. This felt horrible. Completely soul crushed me. I'm never doing it again. And then they get nowhere. Evie, the title of your book is Becoming Bulletproof. Can you describe to us what a bulletproof person looks like? A bulletproof person is someone who is trying to always become resilient. I, I, I titled the book Becoming Bulletproof because I wore a bulletproof vest. A vest is made out of Kevlar. Now, Kevlar is made out of fabric, really thin layers of fabric. And when you put the fabric together, one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer, it makes your vest and it makes it resilient. Now, I, I, made, I made the book similar to that because I'm giving you all these layers of fabric. And when you put them all together, these chapters, that creates your own bulletproof vest. It's supposed to shield you from harm, from problems. It's supposed to protect you. Now, at the same time, though, you're not completely protected. Your legs are exposed. Your arms are exposed. Your head's exposed. So when I put my vest on, I always knew, like, hey, I'm as protected as I can be, but I'm also vulnerable, and that's okay. Because we have to accept our vulnerabilities and be okay with them rather than fear them. And with the title Becoming, I wrote it, I put Becoming Bulletproof because we're always becoming, even myself. Every day I'm looking to learn, to be better, to be stronger. We are becoming a better version of ourselves constantly. You know, I have the saying, is the day you think you know everything, it is the day you become obsolete. And so it's having that mindset. So it's being strong, trying to be strong, but then being okay with where you are vulnerable because we must be okay with that. And then to constantly pursue resilience. To constantly say, okay, well, you know what? I just messed this up. I didn't handle this the best way. Now how do I overcome it? Rather than saying I'm never going to do that again, I'm going to stay away from this, and living in a very fear-based mindset. You know, if you're right because I like when you say pursue resilience because it really is something that you have to continually work on. My life up until middle age had been pretty easy. I mean, it was the the textbook of what a life should be. Great family, went to college, married my college sweetheart, two kids. Everything was in order. And then about 10 years ago, everything fell apart. I dealt with my father going through cancer and, and watched him pass away. My mother died. My sister died. My 23-year marriage ended. My son left for college. And most of those things outside of my father happened within six months in my life. And I understand because I had to learn how to be resilient. I had to make that decision that I wasn't going to be a victim. So from all of that, I founded two companies. I started this brand. I'm doing this work. And anything is possible from that adversity. But you're absolutely right. It's something you have to work at and choose to do. It's a choice. You know, it's interesting. My father my father just passed uh, several months ago from cancer. And, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I have no choice. He's going to go. I can't, I can't stop that. But I have a choice in how he goes. And I think it's when life throws things our way, when we think, oh, my gosh, this is happening. How could this be happening? And we feel hopeless. In every moment of our lives, you always have a choice. And you can choose. It may not be the choice you want to make, right? The choice would be like, I don't want my father to die. It's like, well, that choice I don't have, so I'm not going to waste time on that. But I have a choice in how I let that happen and what I can do for when that happens. You know, in in the the beginning of the book, I open up with my story and my experience with with September 11th. And I I talk about, you know, when I was there, when I was at the towers. And I remember when people started jumping from the towers. You don't really see this now in the news. They They don't show it. And, And I understand why, of course. And there was a lot of people jumping, a lot. It wasn't one or two people. It was, it was a lot of people. And I remember watching, and I, I thought to myself, what kind of choice you're making in that moment where you're saying, I, I'm going to die, I have no choice. But I can choose, though. Even in that moment of hopelessness, I can choose to jump. And they're making a choice. And even in that moment, even in this moment where you think, wow, what a weak, hopeless moment, no. 
You, you find power in that moment because you're saying, I still have power over the outcome. Maybe not in the way I'd hoped, but I still have power. And I think that's where if you can see through that, so like what you went through, when you can see all these hap- things happening to you, you can say, I can be a victim, or I can just surpass that. And I don't even want to say the word survivor. You can crush it. You can thrive in it. You don't want to survive it. You want to go beyond. Because in every crisis, you can find opportunity. And where, what is that and what does that look like? We're all experiencing really challenging times right now. And just about everyone has been caught off guard. What do you think we should all be doing that can better prepare us for the next crisis? I think, well, you know, we might be looking at another wave coming in right. as far as the pandemic. And I think you should be doing what you need to do, which is wearing your face masks, doing the things that you can do, but then also protecting yourself mentally. A lot of the stress people are going through, too, is self-induced. So if you're sitting watching the news, and I, I study journalism, I do the news, when, but if you're sitting watching the news 24 hours a day, just watching the pandemic, 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 the riots, the, everything that's happening, if this is all you are consuming, that is what you become. You're going to be that way. You have to create boundaries for yourself and say, I'm going to watch the news. I'm going to be informed. I'm going to participate in however I want to participate in, 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 in anything that's happening, whether it's a Black Lives Matter movement or whatever I want to do. But then you have to find space where you step away and you say, I need to separate from this because this is not healthy for me to see all this stuff. Put your social media away. Stop watching all these videos. I don't care how strong you are, even the most resilient person, even myself, I cre- I, it will affect me. It, you absorb that energy. And sometimes, you know, if I have to go to somebody's house or a friend's house and I see I walk into that home and they're very panic-based and, or if I need to connect with someone, I do what I need to do and then I leave immediately because I know this person's energy, this person's thinking is affecting me and I'm in a, a good place. I understand, yes, there's a pandemic. I understand so many things are happening. I control what I can control. I, I give also what I can, because giving is a huge thing. It's when you can help in a meaningful way, that is also a great tool to overcoming any, any, any difficulties, finding meaning. But at that point, you want to create like a barrier around you and be like who you're going to let in and what you're going to let in. So a lot of it is not just the pandemic or what's happening. A lot of it is you. Mm-hmm. You're letting this in. You're letting this affect you. You're letting this turn your world upside down. And that's the part that most people forget, just how powerful we each are. You know, a lot of people think that they're a victim, but they're not. We have so much power. You have a choice. Even when when the pandemic first started, I remember everyone being like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I was like, all right, well, it's happening, face mask, washing hands. And, you know, I thought about how can I also contribute as well? And, And when we can help other people, it's so powerful, not just for helping them. From a selfish perspective, truly, it makes you feel better. Science shows it. And I remember I thought to myself, you know, what can I do? And I was like, well, you know, maybe donuts and coffee. Who doesn't love donuts and coffee? And I did something as simple as calling up Dunkin' Donuts and saying, listen, I want to help first responders. These, these people are getting crushed. And what, would you guys want to team up? Every morning I'm going to hit up, you know, uh, I'm going to go to hospitals, emergency rooms, um, the National Guard, law enforcement, all the police precincts. These guys were working around the clock. I was like, just to deliver donuts and coffee. And we went to, to we went over 150 locations in New York. Mm-hmm. And something small like that, it, it gives you a sense of, like, strength and power and contribution. And I would come home and everyone around me is panicking. I'm like, I feel good mm-hmm. because I'm also part of the solution. I'm not just a taker. And so many of us just take. Maybe you've seen so many things in your life and in your career, from protecting presidents to what you described on 9-11. How are you able to manage all of those things that you've seen and yet not become jaded about the world? Uh, but because, but it, you can become jaded, and it's just self-assessment, knowing that you're becoming jaded. And that absolutely would happen to me from time to time. It happened to me a lot when I would do – I did polygraph interviews – and so imagine this, you're in a room and you're talking to someone who's sexually assaulted, raped a little girl, and you're spending hours with this person talking. And think about doing those on a consistent basis when you're talking to people and they're telling you, you're seeing the worst in humanity. And you leave that room 
and you think, oh my gosh, like this is the world, and you begin to see people in a more cynical way. And in fact, one study showed that the, the predominant tra- trait in law enforcement overall is cynicism. Because they're always dealing with the worst of humanity, they tend to see people and humanity at its worst. You have to catch that. You have to catch yourself. So, And I do that from time to time. If I start seeing the world of the people around me, and especially now I'm in the TV entertainment business, which I would argue is a really, <laughs> really difficult business. You know, you're dealing with so much deception, so much dishonesty. It's just such a weird world to navigate. And even then, you know, I catch myself. I'm like, I need to stop thinking everybody's, doing something wrong because there is good in humanity you just want to be cautious cautious is good when you see red flags and certain things and i talk about that in my book that's when your your spidey sense should go up and be like hmm this doesn't sit right with me and then you 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 investigate that further but you also don't want to judge people we want to find the balance you want to have a healthy level of caution but you also don't want to be jaded in life and and again you choose to be jaded because sometimes we choose it because it suits us it suits us. It's me and the rest of the world. Who doesn't love that narrative? And we all know those people. Oh, it's me and everything else everybody's doing to me. And if you can step back and be like, I can't let that be me. I don't want that to be me. So you've mentioned that you've been part of the media. I'm part of the media. We hear so much about how the media is trying to manipulate people in the world. And not just the media, but other people who are, who are disseminating disinformation and, and who have their own motives for trying to get others to see things from their point of view. So you teach about how to, to get your BS meter working and, and to be able to spot these types of things. Is there something that a, a tip or a strategy that you could give our listeners that can help them spot it? Like, is there just something other than having that intuitive feeling? Is there a red flag that usually indicates that someone is trying to manipulate you? Look, if we're talking about the media, these are two things you should ask yourself. Who is this person and why should I listen to them? Always question where your information is coming from. My mother, who is still alive, every time she sees something on Facebook, she's like, look, 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 look. <laughs> read this. And I'm like, who, who wrote this? But she sees it as fact. I was like, and I have to sit her down. I'm like, you have to question who's writing this and what their motive is. And there was one case where she read some blog and she, and it was written so well. It sounded so professional. And then we were able to, you know, using my investigative experience, I did some looking on the internet, some diving in, and we found some guy in his pajamas is writing it in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with no experience. And I'm like, this is who wrote it. We actually got a picture of the guy. I'm like, who is he? This is who's writing this stuff. So you really, again, it's on your own to filter out what you hear and then really assess it. I teach criminal justice and criminology as an adjunct lecturer. And the first day of class, I tell my students, I give you the facts and you decide. Because we're in a world where everybody is telling us what to think and feel everywhere. And know that. Know that everybody has some sort of agenda to some degree. And you have to decide what you're going to consume And what is somebody's opinion, conjecture, or fact? Is what I'm hearing conjecture or is what I'm hearing fact? That's how you assess that, and then you make your own decisions. And I think that's so important. Even in the media, you know, being in news and having been on news, I'm so thoughtful and I try very much to be like, look, I'm going to have a different perspective on this than somebody else's, and I have to be thoughtful in how I relay my information because – we try to make everybody think like me, think like me. And it's just like, no, take the facts and think like you. Don't let other people tell you how you should think or feel because we lose our individuality. We, use, we lose our ability to process and think about things in a thoughtful way, and we just follow herds. We follow the herd. We follow one herd goes this way, the other herd goes that way. It's like, it's like think for yourself. The book is Becoming Bulletproof, protect yourself, read people, influence situations, and live fearlessly. If you'd like to get more information about Evie and her work, you can visit eviepamporis.com, or as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com, which stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Evie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.